My name is Stephen Fluen, and this is Demos with Angular. Today we're going to take a deeper look at Angular Elements. We're going to go ahead and take an existing site, add Angular Elements to it, a little bit like we did in one of our previous videos where we highlighted on v6, but this time we're going to go a little bit further and we're actually going to wire up one of our custom elements into our content management system so that we can go ahead and use the browser machinery to bootstrap that functionality inside of content. And that's the, the big kind of revolution that comes with using Angular Elements. So let's get started. All right, so if we look under the hood at Fluent.io, what we're going to find is a standard content management based Angular application. So you've got article pages, you've got the ability to go in as an administrator and edit this content. One of the nice features that we have as part of the content management system and the administrative section is the ability for you to actually write markdown in the body here. So if I write hello world, and then I go ahead and add some stars around hello, you're gonna notice that this passes through a markdown renderer. And one of the nice pieces about this markdown renderer, I think we're using showdown, is that you can actually pass HTML directly through. So if I called something like app poll, hello, and we take a look at the HTML that's being generated by this, you're gonna see that that HTML tag is actually being passed in directly to the HTML app dash poll. So now normally because Angular has a very strong separation between this idea of code and content, this is treated as content and this is not intercepted or handled by Angular in any way. This is directly passed to the browser. But when we combine that with the concept of Angular Elements or using custom elements and the machinery of the browsery to bootstrap our component, we kind of get a magic situation where we can write our content and embed functionality and then the browser machinery is going to wire it up for us. So let's go ahead and take a look at the project that we've got under the hood. So this is a normal Angular CLI project. It should look very familiar. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to jump to the terminal and we're going to do a few things. First thing we're going to do is we're going to ng add at angular slash elements. And what this is going to do is this is going to go ahead and add the polyfill for us, the document register element polyfill that makes Angular Elements work in ES5. And then it's also going to install the Angular Elements dependency. And so just to get this available to our application, we're going to ng-serve that again. And then we're going to do a few things that actually wire up Angular Elements in our application. In our application module, we're going to go ahead and add a new component. We can do this automatically via the CLI. So if I run ng generate component and I give it a name such as poll, what this will do is this will automatically create that poll component and update it in our app module. And so now we see poll component. To take advantage of Angular Elements, we have to actually ensure that the compiler is compiling this component. And the way that we can do this is by referring to it in the list of entry components. Entry components is basically just a way of saying, hey, compile this component even if it's not referred to from a template. So normally in Angular, we look at all the templates and all your components, and then we use that to determine what we need to compile. But here, because it's being bootstrapped by the browser and not by Angular, we actually have to let it know about that. So next up, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at our poll component. So if we see we have a poll folder. I'll just do some quick cleanup here. I'm gonna get rid of the styles. I'm gonna get rid of the selector because we're not actually gonna be using Angular's selectors to bootstrap the component. And I'm gonna get rid of the ng on init as well. So we just have a very nice, simple poll. Right now it just says poll works and we'll, we'll leave that for now to make sure that it's bootstrapping correctly. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into my app component. And so in this application, it's called fluent.io.component. And we need to modify our constructor to actually give us access to the injector. And we need to make it private or public so that we can access it in other methods. So I'm gonna make a new object called injector, and then it's gonna be of type injector. And we should just be able to use the autocomplete here. And that will give us access to the injector. And now I'm gonna create a new lifecycle event and I'm gonna tap into the ng on init of our app component. We know that our app component is only gonna be bootstrapped one time as part of our uh, bootstrapping of the, our Angular application. And so this is a good place to be doing this because Angular will already be registered, the components will already be compiled, and then we can go ahead and attach our Angular component now into the browser as a custom element. And so 
I'm going to do this using one of the methods that's available as part of Angular slash Elements called Create Custom Element. And I'm going to pass it two things. I'm going to pass it a reference to the component I want. So in this case, that's poll component. And I'm going to give it access to the injector, which we just put on our component via dependency injection. And now this method does not exist by default, so we're going to have to import it. So we're going to import create custom element from at angular slash elements. Uh, if this doesn't work here, what we're going to do is let's go ahead and just double check that the angular CLI uh, actually created angular elements. So let's just ng add at angular slash elements. And then maybe if this doesn't work, we'll run yarn again just for good measure. Let's take a look at ng version. We see elements, so now this should be good. All right, that's much better, and our compilation should actually work when we run ng serve again. So we're just making sure that we have the Angular Elements package installed and that our application is still compiling and serving. All right, that's looking good. Now we've created a custom element with using this create custom element method, but we actually want to do something with it. So I'm just going to say const lm equals this. And now if we want to do something with this custom element, we actually have to pass this to the browser. And the way that you do that with custom elements is you have the custom elements registry. This is just a native browser registry and it has a define method. The define method takes two things. It's going to take the selector. So I'll call this uh, maybe app poll and I'm going to give it our element. So with those kind of two very quick lines of code, we've taken a Angular component, wrapped it as a custom element, giving it access to our injector, and now we've passed that onto the browser so that anything that uses app poll as the custom element or the tag name should get bootstrapped by the browser. So let's go ahead and go back to our project and verify that this is working. Uh, so if I, instead of call this content poll, we could call this app poll. And we'll just save this real quick to make sure it's working. So you'll notice now that uh, within this app poll, we're not actually seeing any content here. It's being intercepted by the browser and bootstrapped as a custom element. So you can see app poll here. You can see that I'm passing in the ID just like I did here. And that it says ng version, which is uh, a side effect of the bootstrapping that we're doing. So right now it doesn't have any functionality, but we're doing the bootstrapping. And so now building out this component is just like building out any sort of standard Angular component. So maybe we want to take in this ID as an input, and then we want to render maybe a couple choices. So let's go ahead and give it a couple inputs here. So I'm just going to use the standard Angular input. And maybe let's, let's take three inputs. So let's take an input that is our ID. We'll call that a string because all attributes from HTML come in as strings by default. Maybe we'll take a option one string and we will take an option two string. So now obviously these can actually be anything you'd like. And so when we delete this template, I can do something like uh, input type equals radio. And what we'll do is we'll say that the value is equal to option one. And then we'll make option one here. And we'll maybe just put this in a couple of little divs. And we'll create another input of type radio for option two. Now, because this is Angular code, you can really do anything that you might normally do. So if you wanted to wire this up to a form using ng model or reactive forms, you can definitely do that. But I'm going to leave that part out. I'm going to leave out the persistence layer and just make sure that these things are rendering successfully. So as long as we've saved this, we should be able to jump back here. And now we're going to see that uh, we've got some blank options here. And then we're going to say option one equals, uh, did you like this? Or, I loved this. And option two can be, I really like this. And uh, I just remembered that you can't actually have, this is actually one of the differences between Angular and custom elements is that you can't have uh, options that are camel case like this. So let's take a look at how to fix that. So I believe it's just a hyphen instead of capitalization. 
Yep, that seems to have worked. So now we have option one and option two being passed in as just string attributes to the custom element. Angular is then wiring those up and passing those into the inputs. Uh, and then the user should be able to interact with these and we'll probably have to give it a name uh, choice just so that they are associated with each other and the user makes a choice between them. Oops, we probably should have saved our options. So now we have the ability to wire up directly in our content, new functionality that then gets bootstrapped by the browser at runtime, not as part of the Angular application. Uh, and this gives you a really nice mixture between content and code. Thanks so much for watching. See you in the next one.